Welcome back to Wager Talk TV. My name is Andrew McGinnis, joined once again by my co-host Dave Koken. This is a very special episode of the KBO Betting Show. Today I have Jiho Yu joining me, a KBO uh, Korean baseball reporter, and uh, you've been doing some great work, some great writing, and I've definitely been using your information uh, on this show as well. So Jiho, thanks so much for joining me here today. No, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for having me. I guess the first question I want to ask you is, uh, how did you get involved in covering the KBO and how long have you really been doing it? Yeah, so I became a, a, I guess, writer back in 2005. I think I began writing about sports the following year, I guess the full-time following year. I was covering different beats early on and then uh, started writing about sports in around late 2005 or early 2006. Um, So how did I get involved? You know, I have some roots in Toronto. Actually, I uh, spent some time there, went to high school uh, and university in that city. Uh, that's where I really developed my interest in sports and also in writing. Um, so, you know, one thing led to another. Uh, and I ended up, uh, I guess, writing about sports. I guess I wasn't good enough to join him. So <laughs> yeah, I played a little bit of baseball growing up, uh, you know, played a little bit of ball and then it wasn't good enough to keep playing on. And um, But I wanted to do something that was related to sports somehow. And I found my, uh, I guess, you know, calling or liking in writing in journalism. So that's how I ended up uh, writing about uh, uh, KBO. Were you a Blue Jays fan while you were in Toronto? Uh, for sure. Yeah, I went to a whole bunch of games. Uh, the old Skydome, I guess now Rogers Center. But um, uh, yeah, so, you know, I've been a Blue Jays fan for, you know, over 20 years. And, uh, you know, looking at my, I don't know if you're watching, but... Uh, I was I was cover, I covered my first spring training this past spring uh, in February out in Dunedin, Florida, and that was by far in all my entire career that was by far my favorite assignment. Uh, just to you know get into the clubhouse, you know mingling with uh, the Blue Jays players and the coaches and and and, uh, and Charlie, uh, you know it, it was a lot of fun. I guess in the pre-pandemic uh, times of, in sports. A question that we've been asked a lot by our viewers is what differentiates the major leagues uh, and Korean baseball, the KBO? So I think it's best to get you to answer that question for us. What would you say the biggest things you've noticed being over there in Korea versus looking at the major league baseball level? You know, aside from the obvious difference in quality of play, um, I I think you will see a lot more balls being put in play in the KBO. Um, You know, MLB, I think, has become sort of uh, three true outcome competition recently, yep. either walks, home runs, or strikeouts. And there's not a lot of action be- in between, right? You take a walk, you kind of walk to the first base. You hit a home run, you try to run the bases. You, you strike out, you try back to your dugout. So there's not a lot of running involved, I would say. Uh, whereas <laughs> in the KBO, uh, you know, the, obviously the hitters aren't as talented as the guys in the MLB, uh, but, you know, they're able to put the ball in play a little more. Even the guys yeah. down in the lineup, the guys that are not necessarily great hitters, uh, they have, they're, they're, they're able to fight off pitches, uh, you know, work deep into the counts, grind out at bats, and put the ball in play. And just because of inconsistency with the defense, if you just put the ball in play, a lot of things can happen. Uh, you know, some you know routine grounders and pop-ups, they might fall for a hit, or they might go through the legs for a hit or, or an error. So uh, you're going to see a, lot, a little more action, I would think, in the KBO uh, than in MLB. Yeah, you know, one thing that I've noticed, Jiho, is that, uh, and I'm not talking from a talent standpoint, but it, just from an approach standpoint, the two-strike approach yep. for hitters in KBO is better than it is for major league hitters. These guys are not up there to strike out with big swings. They, they shorten up their strokes on two strikes and get the ball in play. Something good can happen when you do that. Oh, absolutely. You know. If you talk to some of the former major league pitchers that, that come over here and they will tell you one of the biggest adjustments they have to make is uh, they have to get guys out, especially the guys in the bottom third in the lineup. You can't t- take them lightly just because they're betting seventh, eighth, or ninth. They're going to, you know, they're going to work you. They're going to make you work. Uh, so if you, if, you can't, if you cannot put away those guys with two strikes, then you're going to struggle in this league. Um, and you're not going to see high strikeout totals in this in the KBO. Uh, in terms of you know pitching standpoint, K per nine is not going to jump out for even for the top end guys. Not because they're not great pitchers, 
but it's mostly because the hitters that they, that they face, they can put the ball in play. Jiho, I would definitely describe this league as a very competitive league. And if anybody asks me how my experience has been as both a fan and a sports better, it's definitely been uh, the matchups and everything is different each and every night. However, how would you really describe the skill disparity from one team to the next? Of course, we look at uh, a team like NC and then we look all the way at the bottom to a team like Hanwha. Uh, you know, Dave and I talking about Hanwha every single day, the troubles that they've gone through. How would you describe, you know, and the, the top, the bottom and the middle, how each team really stacks up? Oh, man, even within one team, um, you will see guys that you think, oh, man, this guy could maybe play in the majors. And maybe there's some guys that are in the starting lineup of a very good team. And you see them and you think, maybe he should, he should be playing rookie ball or like high high A ball or double A. So there's quite a bit of, um, I guess, a range of, of talent, even within a team. So if you're talking about a league, granted, this is a small league only with only 10 teams. I used to be eight for, for the longest time and expanded, expanded to 10 back in 2015 with the rival, rival of uh, KT Wiz. So there's, there's a bit of a, I guess, dilution of talent, maybe, since the expansion. Um, you know, you, you talk about NC and Hanwha. Yeah, there's quite a bit of difference there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would think that the, the best player in Hanwha right now wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be able to sniff even AAA. Whereas with, with the Dinos, you know, one of the outfielders, Sombom Na, uh, Scott Boras client, he's hoping to get to the majors next year. He's drawing some interest. He has been drawing some interest for almost since day one. So, so you're looking at up and down the lineup on any given team, you will find some guys that you think maybe would be good enough to play in the majors, but at the same time, there are some guys on the same team who wouldn't be good enough for a rookie ball to stick play. Well, one guy I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to see in the majors pretty soon, and I, I don't know how much it'll get held up because of what's happening with Major League Baseball and the pandemic, but this pitcher uh, for the Dinos, Koo, he yeah. is he is really talented. I, this this is a guy who's got a chance to be a frontline Major League Baseball starter. Um, talk about his potential and 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 how dominant he's been this year. Oh, he's been he's been great. You know, anytime you can get a lefty who can throw, you know, that kind of slider, that kind of uh, fastball. Uh, yeah, he he's been you know he's always had the talent. I would think since. You know, he came out as a teenager out of high school. Um, he's always had the potential. And this is, a, this is a season that he's finally putting it all together. And, you know, there's an interesting theory with some young pitchers this, this year. Uh, there is some, I guess, view that young guys thriving this year on the mound precisely because we have no fans in the stands. Uh, they're, they're, they're not as uh, rattled or as mm -hmm. nervous as they would be with, you know, 20,000 fans in, in a row city, uh, screaming and yelling. Uh, granted, there's only, on the other hand, you know, you would beat off the energy of the crowd uh, if you're pitching, pitching at home. But if you don't have to face hostile crowd every other outing, uh, when it's quiet out there, all you can hear is the, you know, guys from your, from your own team, from the dugout yelling and, and cheering on you. You know, it's going to do wonders to, to your, uh, I guess, uh, mental side of the game. So. It's not only Koo. Uh, I mean, he's been around for a few years now. He's still in his early 20s, but this is the year he, that he's finally putting it together. And there's some other kids that are coming straight out of high school, 18, 19 years old. They're pitching like they're, they've been around. Uh, so I don't know. But, you know, with, with Koo, uh, he's going to need a few more years to be eligible to, to go to the majors. Uh, I think seven full seasons uh, or their equivalent to be able to be posted for major league teams. So he's got, I think, a couple more years left until he can actually test the market there. How does it work as far as the military service requirement is concerned? Has he done that yet, or is that st something that he still has to fulfill? No, he hasn't done it yet. Um, but with the Korean athletes, uh, if you win a medal of any color in the Olympic Games, or if you win a gold medal at the Asian Games, which is like the Olympics for Asia, then you get uh, exemption from the military service. Oh, okay. So with baseball team, um, so Korea has been has won every gold medal in Asian Games since 2010. So this uh, last three Asian Games. So the players who have been on those teams, they've had the exemptions from the military. Oh, okay. And one prominent guy who 
one prominent guy who's done it was uh, Shin Su Chu of the Texas Rangers. He was on the 2010 Asian Games team uh, when he was playing for the Indians at the time. And he, you know, he helped Korea win the gold medal in 2010. So he got the exemption from the military service. Uh, going back further back, we have guys like Channel Park, the first Korean guy to play in the majors. He played in the 90, 1998 Asian Games in Bangkok. Uh, and, you know, the guys on that team got from the military service. So with Ku, uh, I think he, his best hope would be to uh, make the Olympic team next year in Tokyo. And if Korea wins a medal, gold, silver, bronze, then he'll get exemption from the military service. Kind of a two-part question for you here, Jiho, but I, I'm just curious if you could kind of describe to your knowledge, firstly, the path that somebody in Korea would have to take, you know, since we're on the topic, to go over to the majors, and then the path that somebody from America or, or Canada would have to take to go, you know, over to Korea to play there. Because look at a guy like Eric Thames, you know, we, I've read numerous articles. Mm -hmm. I've read some of your articles talking about um, the path that people are taking going over to Korea and then trying to kind of build their reputation back up and hope to get a chance to get back into the majors. How do you really feel that uh, fares for them? And what's the whole approach like for them going from the majors uh, to Korea or Korea to the majors? So from the KBO to the majors, uh, there's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, one is to get posted. Uh, let's kind of like, if you're posted, uh, the rules have changed in recent years where now any team can kind of bid on the player. Uh, and and there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a cap on the amount of money that, can, that the team can put in. And, you know, the players can kind of choose from, you know, if there are multiple teams that are showing interest in them, the player can, player, the player can choose which team he wants to talk to and then they will talk and then you know if they sign a contract uh then the then the player's original kbo team will, will receive a certain amount of fee kind of a transfer fee if you will and then uh it goes from there so through posting uh you have guys like uh, hyunjin ryu the current blue jay pitcher uh, he went to the dodgers through posting back in 2012 and this is before the cap was put in place this is during the uh, sort of silent auction period. So Dodgers bid $25.7 million just to have a chance to talk to him. And then they signed him to a six-year, $36 million contract. So Rio's former team, Hanwha Eagles, they got that $25.7 million as a transfer fee for letting Rio go to the Dodgers. So uh, he, Rio was the first guy to go to the majors uh, through a posting. Uh, then we have some, we've had some other guys to they followed. Uh, and there's another route was to sign out of high school as an amateur before getting drafted by the KO and go through the U.S. minor league system. And Shin Su Chiu is one case. He signed out of high school with Seattle, uh, walked through this, uh, work, worked his way up through the system. And, you know, now he's been in the majors for about 14, 15 years. Uh, Jiman Choi of the Tampa Bay race, same case. He signed out of high school. Um, also, as a pro, if you fulfill uh, eight full seasons in the, in the KBO, then you can become a free agent, so you can sign with anybody. Uh, I, I don't recall anybody who signed with a major league club as a free agent. Most of them, I think, all of them, I, I think, actually have gone through a posting system. Now, the other way, coming from the majors, is all through a free agency. Uh, same with the Thames. Uh, there's a couple of other former Blue Jays, uh, Zach Stewart, Dave Bush, uh, guys like that that were signed as a free agent, it, mostly during the off season, but sometimes during mid season when teams cut their foreign players uh, because they're not happy with the production. Um, and, you know, Thames was a, one of the uh, first guys who went back and had a success back in the majors. Uh, before him, there were some fringe guys, some middle relievers who went back, had some, you know, mild success and then kind of faded away. Uh, whereas Thames, you know, he was an MVP in this league. And then he went back, he 30 homers in his first season back with Milwaukee. So uh, now I think a lot of guys kind of look up to him as a, as a sort of uh, an inspiration, you know. And in the last four or five years, uh, the average age of boring guys that are coming over here has, has been getting a lot younger. Uh, in the early years, we've had some people who were kind of past their primes, kind of washed up people, like former Blue Jay Tyson Burrito. I remember him watching uh, him play. And he was kind of the fringe backup second baseman for the Blue Jays in mid-90s. And he, was, he came over here, he, he just, he mashed. He's 30 homers and 
you know, 1200 mm -hmm. runs. And, but he was, you know, kind of past his prime in the majors. Uh, we had Julio Franco in the KBO for a uh, couple of years. Uh, and he was like 45 years old. Uh, he, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, he played forever. So, uh, but now we, we, we're getting guys that even didn't even play in the majors before. And they wanted to use KBO as sort of a launching pad to their uh, path to the majors. So, you know, maybe they want to get a couple of years in here, put put up some numbers, and then, you know, kind of showcase themselves to uh, big league scouts so that they can go back to the majors or they can play in the majors for the first time. Gio, oh, that's a good lead-in to talking about Addison Russell, um, who yeah. obviously has had, he had some serious off-the-field issues uh, here, and I, I think it affected his on-field play as well. He's really talented. I mean, this guy's a good ball player. He might be able to dominate there, but this is, I think, as much as anything, a showcase for him to show Major League Baseball that he's got his head straight again. Um, did his signing create any controversy? In South Korea, because of the fact that you know he's got a, he had some 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 problems uh, as far as domestic abuse and, and things like that are concerned, and he is basically not not a guy who's wanted in the major leagues right now. I'm curious as to what the process was in terms of him being accepted as a player to be soon playing in KBO. Yeah, there was a little bit of controversy, but I must say uh, it has been kind of overshadowed by. Uh, another issue that his KBO team, the Kyum Heroes, are dealing with. Uh, this uh, Chung Hong Kong, yeah. a former pirate infielder, uh, former hero property, uh, who's had you know three DOI cases uh, recently, uh, DOI conviction back in 2017. He wants to come back with the Heroes. And the Korean people, Korean fans, have a lot of problems really? with that. Uh, they don't want him back playing the KBO. So with Edison Russell, you know, the fact that he came on a Saturday, um, and the fact that, you know, he's probably one of the most recognizable names to ever come to the KBO. Uh, he's an all-star. I won the World Series with the Cups only four years ago. And, you know, people do know about his back, you know, his history of uh, domestic abuse allegations. The fact that he got suspended for 40 games, people all know that. Uh, but I wouldn't think uh, there was as much controversy with his signing as there is with Chung Ho Gong's uh, attempted comeback. Uh, with Russell, um, you know, I got a bit of a flag myself writing a story about their front office and their whole process of signing Russell. And, you know, they basically told me they did their research. They did their due diligence on Russell and, and his background. And they concluded that, you know what, you know, he served, he, he served his penalty. Uh, the fact that it was 40 games, not 80 games, uh, we were comfortable signing him. Uh, I mean, the fact that he came back to play for the Cubs for a bit after the suspension, yeah, uh, that was good enough for the team. And they said, you know, there's a lot more that we know about this guy than maybe the public does. And, you know, we were, you know, what he did was wrong, but it's not bad enough that he can, he cannot play baseball any longer. So we gave him a chance. We gave him this deal. And for me, I don't know, I would give the team a benefit of the doubt a little bit. You know, they're investing a whole bunch of money on this guy, $530,000. That's a lot of money for this, this ball club. Yeah. And they're not known to spend a lot of money on players. And the guy they were there was playing in front of before him, Taylor Motter, he was the cheapest guy among the all among all foreign players this year, uh, was three hundred thousand dollars. And they're paying Russell more money to play fewer games for a shorter period of time. So, you know, the fact that they're they made this investment in this player, doing having done what they did as far as the research research is concerned, you know, I would give the team a little bit of a you know benefit of the doubt. But at the same time, it's not good for the optics. Uh, you know, if you look at the history of this ball club, I mean, their former CEO is in jail for investment. Oh. And it starts from the top. You know, they've got a couple of other players who are accused of sexual uh, sexual assault. I mean, they, got, they walked free last year, but, you know, they faced the accusations a couple of years back. You know, their former captain was suspended for 36 games for hitting a teammate with a baseball bat. Oh. Uh, you know, wow. one of their pitchers. One of the pitchers got suspended for 50 games for hitting a teammate in high school, and they found out later. So they suspended him for 50 games in his rookie year. So it goes on and on. I mean, uh, you know, th this franchise has had to deal with a lot of these issues off the field. And now they've got Chung Ho gone and Edison Russell to add on that. So I don't know. I think the cynics will say Edison Russell would fit right in just because of, you know, what they've gone through. But uh, <laughs> uh, right now, uh, you know, Kong issue is far bigger than uh, Edison Russell at the moment yeah. for the Heroes. 
I wanted to ask you, you know, we talk about these uh, foreign players, these <laughs> import players coming over to the KBO. Yeah. What type of importance can we really put on them and, and the pressure and the emphasis that gets put on these players every single day? Dave and I are breaking down these games one by one. We have commenters in our chat box. They're recognizing names. They know guys like Dan Straley. They know certain names that are recognizable. And, uh, you know, as far as a betting perspective, they're more likely to, to look at, to bet on a team because they know this name. So my question to you is um, how much more uh, pressure is really added on the, those guys when they're out there on the mound, seeing as you know, what they're paid and uh, what's really expected out of them and how much emphasis would you say you would put on them uh, and, and them as pitchers and as a whole team when they're coming over like a guy like Addison Russell, when he comes over uh, the pressure that might be on his shoulders up, Obviously, he's being paid a very healthy sum, um, but uh, in comparison to uh, you know just playing in the majors, obviously he's coming over. Many people might say there's more skill uh, for there, but I think they still have to prove themselves. How would you uh, how would you argue the comparison of, of skill level? Because I think it's still very very close. Obviously, pitching has been great, but um, you know I think that a lot of people are, are not you know giving enough respect to some of these Korean born uh, batters and pitchers that are playing outstanding. And, uh, you know, the foreign pitches are great, but uh, how would you compare the pressure they have? Yeah, so in terms of pressure, there's, there's no question. These, these guys are under a ton of pressure, and they're on a short leash too. And, yeah, I mean, they get paid a lot of money, but some Korean players, maybe they get paid a lot more, a little, a little more when you convert into Korean, Korean currency. Uh, but you know, the fact that there are only three of them for each team, two pitchers and one position player, and those two pitchers, they're expected to be number one and number two starters mm -hmm. for the most part. And there have been very few occasions where a foreign pitcher came in and he was the closer. Uh, but for the most part, they're expected to be number one and number two starter. And foreign hitters, they're expected to be hitting in the heart of the lineup. Uh, and, you know, or e either that or play a premium position. You look at guys like Dixie Machado with the Giants, he played shortstop, maybe one of the best shortstops already in the KBO. Um, or someone like Tyler Saladino, maybe not a masher, a slugger in the traditional sense, but he can play multiple positions. And that's where the Samsung Lions want to go with all of the players. They want the players to be able to play, handle multiple positions. And they want Tyler Saladino to lead the way because he's got the major league pedigree. Um, yeah, so they've got a lot of pressure on, the, on their shoulders. Uh, there have been some big names. That didn't pan out in recent years. Someone like James Loney actually played in the KBO for a bit. He didn't really? pan out. Uh, Scott Benz like from yeah. Dodger. Oh yeah, James Loney came in mid season. He, uh, you know, uh, he was really struggling, and then uh, they wanted to they wanted to send him to the minors for a bit just to give him a breather, try to help him get his act together. And he just left. He just packed up and left for the states in mid season. Uh, someone like Scott Benz like for the Tucson Bears played I think 2018 very briefly. You know, you know, play for the Dodgers yep. for a bit. He didn't pan out. So, uh, so you have to come in with the right amount of mindset. Uh, you have to be able to handle the pressure, the expectations that you come in. You know, you account for maybe those three guys. Maybe they, they account for you know thirty, forty percent of the whole team's uh, uh, you know their their strength, and they're they're obviously a big part of the team. And uh, rarely does a team win a championship without having you know, good foreign starting pitching, or even, I, I guess you can get by without foreign hitters, but without foreign pitching, it's yeah. hard to win in this league. Just and because, we've noticed them pitching you know, five in the games as well. Oh, yeah. 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 So, you know, five minute rotation, you got two foreign guys with a major league experience. If they can get you 15, 20 wins, then you, you'd be in great shape. But if, if you don't get that kind of production from your foreign guys in the rotation, this is very hard to win, the, win in this league. Uh, I want to bring it up the gambling for a moment because, you know, it, it's becoming more and more accepted and legalized in this part of the world. Um, uh, certainly a lot of states are now offering legalized wagering and even the states, you know, the states where they don't have legalized wagering, it's not like people aren't betting on, on games in every sport, including baseball. What's the situation as far as that goes in South Korea? Well, there is legalized uh, betting on sports. You can buy something like Sportsline. Um, you know, there's certain amount of money you can. There's a cap on the amount of money you can you can bet on. Uh, you can only legally you can only bet on the results. Uh, but there's a there's a sizable, I guess, uh, 
you know, shady market <laughs> for sports betting. Uh, it doesn't matter where you are. A lot of <laughs> yeah, <we're>, yeah. <laughs> I know exactly. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of prop bets available, you know, like, and then, you know, the, the, and that was kind of tied to the match fixing uh, scandal in the KBO and also in professional soccer league in this country a few years back. Whereas, uh, you know, some fringe players, some pitchers, they were approached by these uh, gamblers that, you know what, we'll give you this amount of money if you do this. If we, we'll give you, we'll match your salary if wow. you do that, that kind of thing. So, wow. like, you know, if you walk the first bet of the game, if you walk the first bet of the game, we'll give you this amount of money. <laughs> or if you, uh, you know, if, if you're like, I don't know, do whatever. So a lot of prop bets available uh, online uh, in, I guess, uh, uh, some shady uh, places. But legally, you can bet on results uh, of the games. And uh, you can, I think you can, the maximum amount, I think, is US $100 or something like that. Oh, wow, okay. Bet on, uh, so so yeah. I'm assuming then that the underground market is flourishing because uh, I'm sure there's people who want to bet more than $100, and if they can't oh, yeah. do it, they're going to find a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the, so I think there's one player who, got, who was involved in this illegal marketing market, uh, illegal betting market. So uh, I think he got uh, he got banished from, from, from the KBO for, huh. for his involvement uh, in this underground betting market. As far as the league goes, just looking at, taking a look at the standings right now, I've got uh, NC, mm -hmm. Doosan, and uh, Kiwoom top three. Uh, you know, I don't need too much out of you about them, but uh, just give me a little bit of uh, thoughts from yourself about them and uh, how they rank. Because as uh, we discuss on our shows each day, you know, these standings are going to move up and down uh, each and every week. Obviously, NC has held a very strong spot at number one. Uh, what can you tell us about the top three teams right now in the league? Yeah, so those top three look pretty solid. But I would think that uh, Dusan Bears have a lot of injuries right now. Uh, I think... You know, one third, or close to half of their regulars are sidelined yeah. for the time being. So, they they might be overachieving a little bit right now. But they've always been a team that has had strong uh, feeder system. Uh, they've always had guys come up out of out of nowhere in the minors from the minors and then produce right away. So, uh, you know, they've had a pretty good development system for years, and they might be relying on some of those um, minor league talent in the coming weeks just because of all the injuries. Uh, with the NC Dinos, um, yeah, they've been dominant from from opening day. Um, you know, maybe people talk about a softer schedule at the beginning of the season, but you can only play the team that you're facing. So, you know, the fact that they're taking care of the business, that's good enough for a sign to me. And a, lo a lot of pundits ex had expected them to be in the top four for sure, but to be in first place this deep into the season uh, by three or four games up any given day, uh, that's a bit of a surprise, must, I, I would think. With, with Kiwum, yeah, you know, they, they were runner-up last year, brought back essentially the same team this year. Uh, but, you know, they've also had some injuries, injury issues and some slumps from guys like uh, Pyeonghwa Park, a former Minnesota twin. Uh, you know, at one point, I think he was the worst hitter among the qualified batters in batting yeah. average, batting below the Mendoza line. But he's kind of he's kind of coming back. He had a couple of homers the other day. Um, he's, he's never lost that power stroke. Uh, but this is for me, for him, it's just a matter of getting on a you know hot streak, and he, he he can take off from there. So they're a very good offensive team, you know, entertaining team to watch. Um, their their bullpen is a little taxed, just because their their starters have not been able to pitch deep into games, other than Eric Jokic and Jake Brigham, the other American starter. He's yep. been out for a while. I don't think he'll be back until until mid July at the earliest. So they're gonna have to kind of try to get by without Jake uh, in their rotation. But there, I think they've got enough firepower to to win a few games. Um, they were talking on the ESPN broadcast last night uh, about possibly within the next few days, actually, or the next week, uh, a certain percentage of seats being made available to fans. Can you update us on that? And uh, will anybody show up for the Hanwha Eagles games if they're allowed to? <laughs> Oh, why not? No, I mean, I don't like to have one of the most loyal fan bases. They better be. Um, you know, if you, no, no. I mean, if you, um, you know, if if you enjoy watching training, <laughs> yeah, I know. So, can you? Um, did you? I mean, can you believe the way they lost that game yesterday? That was unbelievable. Uh, the ninth inning melt. It was the only game played yesterday, and it's like this. This isn't going to happen, yeah. and, and then it did. 
No, I mean, nothing surprises with that team for me anymore. Like, nothing surprises me uh, what they do. Uh, you know, but they do have, even the TV ratings, I think they're, the last time I checked, they were number one in really? cable TV ratings. Wow. Okay, so very loyal oh, yeah. fan base, so, Gio. The fans are watch. Yeah, fans will watch, and you should have seen back in 2018 when they messed up, when, when they reached the postseason for the first time in 11 years, all the Panta first region coming out of the fan base. Oh, all that. Except, even though they, yeah, even though they lost in the first round, it was their first postseason in, in 11 years, and yeah, you should have seen them. There, there was, there was, there was pretty amazing, <laughs> and you know, I mean, they're not going anywhere this year, but um, fans are still gonna watch, and they're still gonna show up. In terms of you know fans returning to KBO games, um, I don't. I think it's premature to talk about specific date when fans will start coming in. Uh, they're gonna the, the KBO is gonna. They've been talking to the government with Korean CDC about this uh, pretty much every week. You know we're not gonna be able to do this, and how many fans are going to be coming in initially? So you know the initial talk was to have the fans back by the end of June maybe, uh, but that kind of that was shelved because there was a sudden spike yeah. in COVID nineteen cases right. in and around Seoul, and then that was kind of okay. We're gonna we're gonna hold, we're gonna hold that for a bit, and then uh, there's been sort of very persistent, you know, double figure number of cases uh, in and around the the capital city. So uh, I don't think we're gonna, you know, we're sitting at June twenty fifth in Korea right now, so I don't think we're gonna have a fans back in June, uh, but definitely in July, I think they're gonna try to have some fans back because one. You know, obviously, fans want to see the games themselves. And two, the teams are struggling financially without any sure. games. Yeah. Um, they're very gate dependent. Uh, uh, you know, they've been trying to get by without selling tickets, having fans come in, buy concessions, or buy merchandise at the stadium. So um, I think July might be a breaking point in terms of their bottom line. If they get past July without fans coming, uh, maybe in our situation, Teams are taking out loan banks just to pay salaries. Um, and unlike in MLB, there isn't any talk of cutting salaries for player team employees at the beginning of the season. So they're getting right. paid in full. There is no furloughs, no uh, no pay cuts, uh, you know, no sort of squabble between the players and, and, and the owners about, you know, prorated salaries and whatnot. There's, there's been in the KBO. The, the teams are paying these guys full, but only so much that they can do without their gay receipts. So, uh, you know, the hope is to have some, some fans back in July, maybe 20, 25% of the seats at first, and then gradually go. From yeah. And, and I think one big difference is that, uh, it's all privately owned here, uh, in, in, uh, in Korea, these are all corporate owned teams and they actually expect, they're not actually trying to make money. They want to get their brand out there. Uh, it's, it's, it's more of a public relations thing. So they're losing money. But, you know, there's a limit on how much you want to lose. Oh, exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, th during this pandemic, everybody's struggling. Yeah. You know, they can't, the baseball teams, they can't just go to their corporations and, and they say, hey, we need, we need this amount of money because their corporations are also struggling financially. So, uh, you know, it's a difficult situation for everybody uh, financially. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, I think. You know, the one good thing that's, that's been coming out of this, there's been no sort of animosity uh, between the player side and the owner side. They're getting paid in full. The, team, the teams are trying to trying their best to, you know, you know, get this going. But, you know, July, in reality, July might be a breaking point. So they want, they would ideally want to have, they won't want to have fans back in July. I wanted to go back to the standings real quick and look at some teams that are in the middle of the pack. So I'm talking your Kia, Samsung, Lotte, those type of teams. Uh, for those three teams, which which out of them do you see trending upwards or trending downwards? Because to me, it's almost the most interesting to discuss middle of the pack teams uh, to try and figure out which way they're going to be going. I've been impressed with Samsung recently, Jiho, because they've had the ability to win lower scoring games, win higher scoring games, and uh, both their starting pitching and their bullpen pitching has been, uh, you know, pretty fair. So uh, what are your thoughts on those three teams? Yeah, Samsung is, uh, their, their bullpen has been really impressive. Yeah. And their bullpen was, I think, one of the best in the league before uh, Sing Hwan Oh came back, former Blue Jay, one-time Blue Jay uh, reliever. It's the greatest closer in KBO history. Uh, you know, they're, they're only going to get better, their bullpen. They've, they, they come at you from everywhere, you know, righty, lefty. They even got a lefty uh, submarine pitcher 
uh, I think the only one in the league. Uh, and also one obviously closing out games, hard throwing righty. So uh, as long as they can, uh, you know, stay up, you know, seventh or eighth inning, they, I think they're fine. Just that uh, their lineup is not that, uh, it's not that exciting. Uh, they're a rebuilding club. Uh, they're, they're giving a lot of young guys a chance to play. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know that uh, they might, they will make the playoffs this year. Uh, but uh, in the next couple of years, for sure, they're going to they're gonna be a lot better. With Kia, uh, they've got the best rotation, I would think, uh, in the league, up in top to bottom, uh, pro, you know, possibly the deepest uh, rotation. And it'll do really great bullpen, uh, except for the time that they blew the lead in the ninth inning a couple of days ago against Lotte. Uh, that was the first blown save by the closer in the game. But uh, other than that, they've, they've, they've been really good. But also, they need to you know, score a, a, a little more than that. Uh, with Lotte Giants, uh, you know, talk about loyal fan base. Uh, they've got a crazy fan base down there. And I'll, I, I'll tell people, whoever will listen, that this is a team that's maybe just good enough to break your heart. Uh, you know, they, they, <laughs> they, begin the, they, they begin the season 5-0, and oh, and then went something like 5-12, and 12, and then they won a whole bunch in a row, and then they kind of, you know, they lose a few in a row here and there. So, uh, you know, they, they need to score more runs for Dan Straley. I yeah. would think he's the best foreign pitcher this year, but they're scoring about one run per game, one per his start, 1.25 at the, the last time I checked. So, you know, he needs more run support. I mean, he's got a <laughs> two point something ERA. He's got a one and two record. I mean, you know, that's what tough. more can he do, right? That's so tough. That's oh, tough, I, man. You know. So, I mean, they're, they're hitting pretty much every other game. So they, they need to hit, they need to start hitting more with Dan Straley on the mound. Yeah, Bob. No, they, they can keep doing the same thing because I've been betting under uh, the, on the total when Dan Straley pitches and, and it, the, don't okay. cash those tickets. <laughs> okay. He's been terrific. I mean, he had he had some control problems when he first started the season, but, I mean, his last four or five starts, he's arguably been the oh, best yeah. pitcher in the league. I mean, he's been sensational. And you can see where Straley, he, he, was a, he was a good, you know, at least a decent major league pitcher, and uh, he knows what he's doing out there. Oh yeah, he's he's been great uh, on and out, on and also off the field. Uh, you know, on the mound he's obviously been great, but off the field, the way he's gone out of his way to oh, that's cool. Really trying to great. be a part of the team. You know, like he's I don't know if you guys heard, but he produced a T-shirt with the image of his catcher uh, on it, and the catcher's like 18, 19 years old, and Australia didn't find out he was that young until after the season. And he was like, oh, I knew he was young, but I didn't know he was 19. <laughs> and uh, he, he made a T-shirt with the photo of his catcher kind of, you know, during the National Anthem pregame. And he made it for just for the team at first. Uh, but the team kind of convinced him to, you know, make it available for the fans. And, nice. you know, it kind of it, it blew up. Uh, I think they sold like, you know, a few hundred uh, T-shirts uh, as soon as it went online. So, um, you know, he, he's been a great teammate also. Uh, the fact that, you know, I think there's one game when uh, his catcher kind of missed the pitch. It was a wild pitch and ended up costing him a round and costing him a victory. And he was showing he was shown on, on, on a TV cam. It was caught on TV camera, you know, in the dugout, actually telling me it was okay. You know, we we do next time and that kind of thing. So he's really enjoyed himself to the fans and to the to his teammates with the Giants. How big has it been uh, for the fans, the players, uh, anybody connected with KBO? To know that they've got a brand new audience now in the states that's that's really enjoying the action, even though it's on at a crazy hour here. There are a lot of people that are staying up to watch these games. Um, I, I would think that that's yeah, maybe it's pressure on one thing on one hand, but it's got to be really rewarding for all the fans and and players uh, to know that their game's starting to to catch on national internationally. Well, it's a huge deal. Uh, you know, there's never been this much interest in internationally in the KBO since its first season back in 1982. I mean, ESPN, that's about as big as it gets when you're yeah. talking baseball and get coverage. And plus, uh, in addition to ESPN in the U.S., um, I, I believe it's being broadcast live in 130 countries, uh, including Canada. Um, wow. Yes. Through, uh, through ESPN affiliates and subsidiar subsidiaries in, in other parts of the country. So you're getting KBO games in Africa and Middle East and Europe oh. live. So there's a lot of exposure there. And at first, you know, I talked to some guys who were, 
you know, maybe they're they're getting maybe a little conscious of the fact that they're being seen live in ESPN, and they're maybe you know grabbing grabbing the bats a little tighter, and then you know, trying to do a little too much. Uh, but that I think that passed really relatively quickly. You know, after a while, after a short while, it became sort of the business as usual. You know, they weren't kind of they were no longer aware of that ESPN spotlight, if you will, and then they just started playing, uh, you know, baseball. Uh, but with some American guys, the foreign guys that have come over, you know, it's kind of ironic because maybe they didn't get any, maybe they didn't get to play on ESPN when they were playing the majors. Maybe their team didn't make the ESPN Sunday Night Baseball mm -hmm. or Wednesday Night Baseball. But now that they're playing the KBO, you know, maybe they're getting on ESPN two or three times a week. So, and they've they've got the family and friends watching back home. So it's it's pretty ironic or interesting situation for those guys. Gio, we're, we're very thankful to have you on the show. We're very appreciative for you taking the time. I want to take this opportunity for you to just uh, let everybody at home know where they can find you on Twitter and uh, all your writing work. Oh, please don't find me on Twitter. Yeah, so you can follow me at Gio uh, underscore one. That's J-E-E-H-O underscore one. Uh, and I work for a uh, uh, Yonhap News agency in Seoul. Uh, y O N H A P News. You can you can look that up. Uh, I've got a, a link to the website and my uh, Twitter profile page as well. So if you just click on it, you'll be led to the sports page. I cover KBO. I write about soccer, golf, the three sports that are going on in Korea at the moment: professional golf, and, and professional soccer, and professional baseball. So I write about those sports. Um, so if you're interested in Korean sports, yeah, just come find me. Excellent. Thank you so much again. This has been a special edition of the KBO Betting Show. We appreciate you all for joining us and watching this special video. Jiho, thanks again so much for your time. For Dave Koken, I'm Andrew McGinnis. Everyone, thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow on our edition of the KBO Betting Show.